Thank you, Sister Liz, and uh, we bless God for this morning. Thank you for the worship and thank you for the prayer. I give glory to God for such a time as this to worship and to praise him and even for this platform that has really kept us in fellowship and in prayer and waiting on God. Um, my name is Grace Aine and uh, I minister with the Anglican Flames. I'm a member of All Saints, I think, from 2002. And uh, I thank God that um, he chose today to have me lead uh, us into into sharing. And um, you, you read the scripture pretty well, but maybe before we dive into it, let me also pray, King of Kings, I glorify you. I praise you and I give you honor. There's no one like you in all the earth. You alone are mighty. You alone are awesome. There's no one like you. Uh, we know, King of Kings, that we can search for all eternity. But we'll not find anybody who's like you. So I ask that today as we gather, your presence will be in our midst and your presence will be our portion. Father, may you separate us from any manner of weaknesses, any manner of sin. I pray that you... Clothe me with your word, clothe me with your valor, and clothe me with your confidence to speak of what you've put on my heart. I give you glory for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for all of us, and I ask that through the atonement of this sin, his blood will continue to wash us clean of all iniquity. I pray that we will be seen as your anchors. Father, wherever we pass, wherever we speak, wherever we step foot, people will see and admire and say, yes, these are my children. I pray that this radiance, King of Kings, will go on to the others, O oh Lord, who don't know you. And I pray that we'll be able to worship you and to praise you and to experience the good works that you do in all that you love. I give you glory for our families and for our cathedral and for the people that serve there. I ask that you continue to be the Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom over everybody on this call, in our church, in our fellowship and everyone, King of Kings, who listens and subscribes to your word. I give you praise in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Liz, you can Amen. confirm that you can hear me. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you read the scripture for us very well, and um, as I really read through and planned through this uh, this message, I kept on, you know, looking and pondering about the words, the fragrant offering and the sacrifice to God. I mean, fragrance is out of uh, sweet essence and sweet aroma, um, how it is to liken um, our relationship and our imitation with Christ to the fragrance that goes to him. I mean, the scripture is quite clear. So you read for us Ephesians 5, and um, it's it's quite a rich, healthy scripture. Um, and I will try to dwell on those first uh, one, I think, to eight verses uh, because of, of the time that we have um, to bring out what the Lord has put on my mind. As uh, saints, as you already know, the, uh, most of us probably have not prepared ourselves for the resurrection day. Sometimes I ask myself, what will happen? I mean, yes, we've read scripture, and but what we have in our minds is this painting as of a movie um, you know, uh, bone to bone, people getting out from where they are and uh, that uprising. I, I, I don't know how best all of us are prepared, but I always paint a picture of that day. As you journey through um, the Ephesians, God shows us um, some beautiful and amazing things about this life that Christ um, has provided for us. When, when, when he enters our lives, he does not leave us the same way we are. He leaves us a bit different, but he begins a work in us that continues for all the rest of your time with him and uh, the rest of our time with him on earth. As a result, we are changed, not just in superficial ways in our work, in our walk and talk um, that don't count much, but we are changed and transformed deep in our, in our beings, like what Paul says, a renewing of the what? Of the mind. The change inside of us is to be so, you know, dramatic and and, and uh, fulfilling that Jesus even compares this to being born again. Um, Paul, again, refers to it in Ephesians by saying that when we get born again, we are putting off the old self 
and putting on the new self, created to be like God in righteousness and holiness. This is a seller moment to even think how you can relate or imitate God in that nature, in righteousness and holiness. I mean, scripture tells us we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we are challenged to imitate, I always get back to this. So in verse 1, we find the word therefore, uh, as I study the scripture, uh, this means it points us backward into an, a, a preceding chapter, maybe chapter 4. And on this basis, uh, on the basis of uh, what Paul shares in that chapter, uh, then we are to have a certain response. And here is a response that I, uh, we see in that scripture. Be imitators of God. Therefore, be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love. Live a life of love just as Christ loved us, gave himself up, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Friends, how lifting is it that we should come to this verse today? Here, God's, God's word says that we are to imitate or to, in other words, to mimic God. So I ask myself some two questions. What is the best example um, of imitating God in the way that he loves? And what is the best example of the way that he loves? I mean, you can imitate the way that he loves, but what is the best example of the way that the Lord loves us? Death of Christ on the cross, uh, which later becomes an offering and a sacrifice uh, to God for us, is the way that he actually demonstrates his love. But the way God loves is so different from what we normally see that the scriptures even use an entirely different word to describe it. Um, you, you, you must have heard or experienced in times before uh, the, uh, the people using the Greek language. And um, here they quote at least four different words which might be translated to love. Each of them describes love in different forms and different degrees. But when Paul tells us in verse 2 that Christ loved us, he used the word agape, which refers to a giving sacrificial love or a love that gives um, without asking for anything in return, no measure, undeserved, unconditional love that no, no that love uh, comes no matter what the condition. That's the kind of agape love that Christ is for us. This is a love that depends entirely on the one who loves and not on the merit of the one love that is you and me. So we receive this love so undeservedly. And uh, I like that Paul uh, insists on this and describes it for the following scriptures and how we're supposed to, 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 to behave as those loved by Christ, as those who should imitate and, um, with, with a fragrant offering. A great example of the, in the scriptures uh, is, I found was in Romans, Romans 5, Romans 5, 8, yeah. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This love is a love that represents a self-emptying self-sacrifice. We didn't deserve anything. We were sinners end to end, but Christ died for us. And this, uh, in Romans, we're saying that God was demonstrating how much he loved us. So it's only fair of us to replicate that. That's the kind of love Paul saw when, uh, when he thought about Jesus dying on the cross. On the cross, I think Jesus freely gave of himself for our sakes. On the cross, again, Jesus sought our, our good rather than what was in, our, in his own good or what was in our own thoughts. On that same cross, Jesus made sacrifices for and on our behalf. We were the ones meant to be on that cross. On that cross, Jesus gave without asking or seeking anything in return. Romans 5, we undeservedly received this one. But when we pay attention to these two verses, um, uh, Ephesians 5, 1, 2, 3, and, and 4, I hid there. Um, the, the word love is actually used in, in, in quite different ways. First, um, it comes off to be like uh, an adjective of, of sorts uh, by saying, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Actually, the KJV version reads, dear 
children. In that case, the word love is the word dear. So God looks us looks at us in that dearly moment of of a father and a child. Second, uh, this, this this word love it also comes through like an, an a noun. Uh, live a life of love, meaning we are supposed to walk and and uh, experience and radiate a life of love. Walk in love, as some versions uh, actually put it. And, and and third, uh, the the word love is uh, it comes through like a verb, just as Christ loved us. So we have an adjective, we have a noun, now we have a verb. All forms of the same word to describe not only the love of God for us and the kind of life we are to live, but I gather it also describes the supreme example of love when Christ gave Himself for us on the cross. So we are supposed to imitate this love. Let's break it down a little bit more uh, to uncover some uh, other treasures that God has put up here for us. Uh, in verse 2, Jesus, just as Christ loved us and, and gave himself up for us, this phrase is used uh, a number of times, and I, I gather it describes how Jesus was given over to the chief priests and the elders of the people to be tried and falsely charged. You know, before the leaders we see in Matthew, it described that Jesus was handed over to the pilot. Uh, Jesus was handed over to uh, to the people. The pilot handed Jesus over to the people, and it also described that uh, Jesus was later handed over to the soldiers to be crucified. So we see Christ being offered by all these the leaders and, and the like later to the soldiers to be crucified. But we should not miss one truth here that Christ gave himself up for us. It's true in the physical, you could see these items happening, but he himself gave himself for, 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 he gave up himself for us. The cross and the grave were not an accident as far as Jesus Christ was concerned, never. Jesus' life was not taken from him. Death was not something given to Jesus against his own will. He just gave himself up. It was his decision, his plan. I believe it was his will. It was his sacrifice and not a sacrifice forced, forced upon him by anybody else. Jesus deliberately chose, as, a, as Isaiah put it, to be led like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't try to escape. He didn't try to pull away and hide. He was obedient to death. Even death on the cross, he willingly drank from the Lord's cup of wrath. What a man of love we're supposed to radiate. Um, and, and Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. This is what we defined earlier as agape love. And uh, his sacrificial death was for us. We turn to what God said through uh, um, the, the prophets, uh, prophet Isaiah. Uh, and and, and uh, the scripture there says, I think it's Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that was brought on us, the, the punishment that, that had brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we were healed. Friends, Christ's love was for us. Christ gave himself up for us. Imagine, for us, not any other uh, created being or what. These are thrilling, interesting uh, words to explain this love he had for us. They are thrilling and beautiful just on the surface, but they are deeper uh, in beauty that goes beyond a casual glance on the scripture. There's this one detail that we, we can also pay attention to uh, in this scripture. The, the little word for is referred to by so many scholars as a, as to, to, to presuppose a substitution, you know, for, for atonement. Um, so I believe to, I believe this is what it means when, uh, when when Christ did, he did for us on our own behalf. The word for means instead of. So when it says that Christ gave himself up for us, it means that Christ willingly took our place on the cross and paid the penalty of our sin, becoming our own substitute to pay for our atonement. So here, do you realize that what this actually means is we can have forgiveness we can have salvation, we can be redeemed, 
we can have a new life, we can have eternal life. It means our sins are covered and we are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. It means that all of this we ask in Jesus' name, it will be provided. And if we ask for forgiveness, there it will be for us. We consider now that, uh, now not only the life that Jesus sacrificed for us, but consider also what the sacrifice involved. Jesus had to plan for it properly. He left the glory of heaven. Okay. He left the glory of heaven and took on the human nature so that he could hunger and get weary like the rest of us and and in the end suffer to die. You know, the incarnation was the preparation of his nerve endings on the cross. On the cross itself, uh, Jesus needed a broad human body and back for a place to be beaten, to be whipped, etc. I mean, he needed a, a skull and, and a head on which to lay the, th the thorns. Uh, he needed cheeks for Judas to kiss and lay, uh, lay setups for him and probably for soldiers to beat. Uh, he needed hands and feet for, you know, spikes to go over. Really, he needed a side where this sword would be pierced for blood to gush just for atonement. And I mean, a whole brain to undergo this this kind of excruciating death. Here I go into a cellar moment. So I tend to believe that as Christians, sometimes we have forgotten how horrible the cross was. It took time and it still does for us Christians to come to terms with this humiliation at the cross. How I pray each day that we do not take this gift would not take this exchange for granted. Um, Christ loved us and gave up himself for us as a fragrant offering. Um, our word is, you know, so beautiful on the surface. And I pray that we should be able to sever this sweet smelling as, uh, aroma. Friends, they, are, they, they mean so much that when we dig deeper, we find that Paul didn't use these words just because they sounded good, no. There was something very specific in mind. He was referring all the way back to time when God first, uh, you know, told the Israelites about the different kinds of offerings, uh, sacrificial offerings, and uh, that they would make uh, to atone for their sin. Uh, to appreciate this, uh, you had to go back to the to 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 the Old Testament uh, in Leviticus to decipher what God said to the Israelites there in the Old Testament and the events of this Leviticus experience point clearly back to what we have in Ephesians 5. Um, first, there, there was a burnt offering in Leviticus 1, which was to be completely burned on the altar. Um, it uh, foreshadowed the complete devotion of Christ and submission to God in giving his life. So the burnt offering is also referred to be as an aroma pleasing to God. The second was a meal. Um, with marination, the making of this meal of this meal offering was to bring fine flour, you know, piled all over the altar, and uh, which symbolically represented, um, yeah, you dapa all on it, which represented the sinless perfection of Christ, being anointed by the Holy Spirit. So the meal offering is said to be an aroma pleasing to God. This is also still according to Leviticus. Then the third was a peace offering which involved offering uh, of, of an animal without defect. The peace offering pointed toward Christ as the one who made peace between God and man. And the two were said to be an aroma pleasing to God. Certainly we know that Christ had no what? Uh, had no harm, had no defect on him. So in, in these three offerings, the peace, the, 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 the grain, and also the burnt offering, we gather a relationship with an aroma that is seen also here in Ephesians. We need to mention the other two offerings uh, just in passing. These were the sin offering and the trespass offering, which are found there. These are a replica of our sins, and they are not considered sweet-smelling aroma to God. And for that matter, Christ sends his son to atone those two. So um, there's a bigger problem uh, in, in Old Testament, because the blood of bulls and goats and lambs could never completely take away sins of the people, they only pointed forward to the day uh, when Jesus voluntarily gave himself to die horribly uh, and in such a bloody death on the cross. So 
at the end of the day, we have the final sacrifice. And friends, this is a perfect atonement that was given to us. Unfortunately, it was done once. There's not any other moment when we shall have another person sacrifice for us. So it's unfair for us to end up again into sin. And we'll be seeing uh, in, in, uh, in uh, sections below what we are required, what is required of us as Christians. So uh, those three offerings in the Old, uh, Old Testament were an aroma and pleasing to God. It means that these offerings were pleasing to him and accepted by him as being sufficient for forgiveness of sins. And this is the same concept that we find in, uh, in, in Paul writing to Ephesians where the aroma of the obedient sacrifice of Jesus is giving himself for us on the cross, rose up into the nostrils of God and smelled sweet to him. So these same things are said to be true of us as Christians. God enjoys the fragrance of a complete obedience from his dearly loved children, that is you and me, who love him so much that they imitate and mimic his nature in the way that they love. Our love is supposed to be a replica, is supposed to mimic, is supposed to imitate this manner of love that Christ did by the, by the dying on the cross for us. Christ loved us so much that he gave himself as such an offering. Such love, the scripture says, is to be standard for the way we live. When we love others and each other, um, we are self-emptying of sacrificial love that puts the needs of others first without thinking about how we are going to be paid back. In my language, it's called okwehayu, like fully offering yourself. Our very lives become a sweet fragrance rising up to God, selflessness, and we are being obedient to scripture, imitating our Heavenly Father. It's not that uh, it's a maybe, it's a can do, it's a what. We are just being obedient by doing this. And uh, we expect that once we love like he purposes us to do, then uh, this sweet aroma will rise to, to, to God in heaven. Greater love has no one like this, that someone can lay down his life for his friends. I think that's John. The greatest act of love ever performed was when Jesus voluntarily offered up his life for the sins of us. Um, suffering and untold emotional, we don't know about it, it's not written, spiritual and maybe the physical pain we saw, but the untold spiritual and emotional pain that Christ suffered, all in my name, all in my name, I keep hitting my chest and saying no. And that those moments come when um, the traps of the enemy are, are so close to us, they, they are so close in our speech, they are so close in our way of work, they are so close in the way we relate with our friends, with our families, you find yourself harboring anger, you find yourself harboring all this, but it is not desired of us. I mean, all this um, emotional and, uh, you know, physical pain is undeserved because Christ atoned. It was the will of the Lord to crush him, but Christ gave up his life willingly. And in being crushed, Christ's loving sacrifice gave off the sweetest and most sacred of, sacred, of fragrances. And uh, as followers, we are called to give no less than what Christ did. Not that we are called to die for others' sins, <laughs> no, but we are called to demonstrate Christ's suffering and sacrifice through our own emotional, spiritual, and even physical sufferings on behalf of others, our work, however, that we may look in our daily lives. When people see us, any of us on this chat today, any of us in this conversation, when people see us, what do they see? Do they say, ah, that guy, like for us who work for the, for the, for the URA taxman, say, ah, that man, when he enters a meeting, that's a fight. When there's a meeting, you know, there's a tax to be paid as an assessment. Sometimes it feels so bad. So when people see us, do they see, do they have that impression of us, of being a bad person, of being a what? Or we radiate they see the love of Christ. They see the person who has been filled, who has been saved, who has been, you know, walking an emotionally and spiritual right life. It is when we're expressing Christ in this way that we, we too become a fragrant offering to God. If we do not, then we are not in anyhow a sweet aroma, not at all. So our conduct, our speech must be in such kind. And that uh, indeed, 
uh, is an aroma that can be, you know, uh, accepted to Christ. So we are called to be imitators. Uh, to say that we cannot imitate God because he is elevated far above us is to miss the meaning of the scripture that uh, has been read for us. God would not um, tell us to do the impossible if it was not possible. Of course, we must imitate God. As a child imitates his father, so must the believer imitate his God. He, he is his child. He will not be able to do the exact things the way God does. I mean, no one is righteous like he is. Neither can a child do the things his father does. Still, we just imitate. So it's a walk, it's a journey that we should be able to carry on. I mean, Christ uh, keeps making us better as we do this. And how do we do it? We pray, we worship, uh, we, we relate with him in that way. Uh, that is a calling that us believers have. Um, the next is that we are supposed to walk in love. Our whole manner of life must be characterized by love. The kind of love that Christ manifested in this death is true love. And this kind is the kind that is approved by God. I mean, God showed his love to us uh, in this death and in our redemption. He gave himself up for us as an offering, as a sacrifice to God. Uh, his love was purely sacrificial. And this is a pattern of love that we expected to move around with as believers. People should see us and see this radiation. Now, there are warnings that follow through in this scripture. So, uh, that if we did not um, action or take in interest of, there would be an outright exclusion from the Christ's kingdom. We read in this scripture that those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Neither do those who are fornicators or unclean persons or covetous men who are idolaters. So important is the work of life to which the believer is called. I must emphasize that Paul always makes a distinction between falling into sin and living in that particular sin. So the exclusion is here that will make us fail. Yes, you, you, you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you're walking the other side of life. I mean, they mentioned those things. And, and I think Paul was not... Um, not mean in using these words. Maybe he had observed the church in Ephesus and the people there uh, having to refer to them as fornicators, unclean, and, and covetous men. But look at the present day life. I mean, these things are all around us. Social media has taken center stage. No wonder it's one of the prayer mountains we must conquer. With all sorts of information, people defame each other, people post all manner of pictures, let it be pornography or otherwise. Yes, you will not take an a physical act in that fornication exercise, but in you're feeding your mind on such things that are as fornication. So the warnings that happened to the FSA still happen to us, and these are dangerous because for those we miss out on the kingdom of Christ and God. Uh, therefore, those who live in an adulterous life or a life of uncleanness have no part at all in the kingdom of God. The covetous man or the greedy man, uh, greed. The haters and uh, those who don't wish good for others, all are here identified as with, or with idolaters. So greed leads adultery, and uh, this means one would be serving Mormon rather than God. For such, there's no place in the kingdom of God. You know, when we ask the Christians, you know, and the whole church stop compromising on such things, I think that's a moment uh, where the scripture says Christ is coming back for his church that has no wrinkle. We surely know it to be true. Let no one therefore deceive you with empty words. Anyone who teaches believers need not to be concerned about these ethical matters is deceiving them. We must be able to tell our fellow brothers, our fellow sisters, the wrath that will happen when we walk in this sin. You will probably be, you will totally be excluded in the kingdom of God. The wrath of God rests on immoral acts of men. That's where it ends and also rests on those who teach falsehoods. A war God cannot deal. So Paul bestows a great deal of work on Christians and, you know, does not wish to see this work 
to be of no effect. You know, but Christ has a far greater investment in us. Surely his work may not be in vain. Therefore, we are told not to be partakers with unbelievers in life which goes contrary to the demands of Christ. I think it's somewhere they say, uh, do not be unequally yoked with what? With non-believers. So is the acts of non-believers. So God demands are always in perfect harmony with, uh, with what Christ desires for us. Uh, the scripture also towards the end tells us we should bear fruit of the spirit. How can then as children of God be sure that we are really his children? This is the question which probably uh, plagues most people uh, through ages. Is there a possibility that he will speak directly to us to assure us of the fact that we belong to him? I mean, can you uh, show forth by the fruit of the spirit that has been working, working in you because of the love that you received uh, when Christ died for you? You know, and uh, we are also warned not to have fellowship with the works of darkness. You know, we must not have fellowship. We must not partake of these deeds. Really, we cannot have fellowship with these deeds because they are works of darkness while me and you are a child of God. Besides, they are unfruitful works while our lives must be fruitful. So we must be far from these for our worship, for our prayer to rise like a sweet incense and fragrance to what? Uh, to God. So there are many questions to ask ourselves in, this, in, in, in these discussions, uh, but I like that the scripture has pointed us to, uh, to, to most of these. Certainly, um, in the first verses, we, we, we've, we've observed that we need to imitate God. God is unwavering love as a guide in the world. And, um, you know, filled with so much uncertainties, we must be able to imitate him so that we are surviving in this world. And we also must demonstrate sacrificial love in the relationships that we have, in the people that we live with. I mean, so many cultural differences. I mean, uh, we don't know how many languages we have in this country, but we, we are so different. But we must demonstrate sacrificial love. You must be there for one another. And uh, we might think that being there for one another is when you have money to give them or when you have what? No. Uh, reaching out, praying, I mean, finding out how they are. I usually get to the office and and uh, I, I greet everyone on the floor. So someone was asking me, why do you this, do this every morning? I don't even intend to do it. It has become a culture to say, how can you live in people and you don't even know who they are? Um, no wonder you go for team building games and then they are saying, please, let's play a game of remembering names. Yet you are the same people in the same office. We are not working in love. Two, it has warned us to avoid any manner of immorality. We must address the prevalent challenges of modern immorality, including the online temptations I've mentioned about. You know, when you navigate the different scores of uh, culture, the different scores of uh, traditions, there are more values that can make you easily separate yourself from God. And we notice that this is an utmost exclusion from his kingdom. Then uh, I think around verse 8 to 10, he says that we should walk as children of the light. That's why we should have the fruit of the spirit and its radiation. We need to become beacons of hope and positivity in, in this world. People should see us and they see a radiation of Christ. Seeking God amidst all the noise that is happening should be our number one. Um, criteria should be our number one thing. No wonder we wake up in the morning for this call, we go for lunch hour, no wonder we go for overnight, no wonder we go for evening prayer. It is a lifestyle that we must live in order to be observed as children of the light who can later uh, please God for our sacrificial offering to rise uh, like he says to him. I mean, imitating what God did. Then lastly, we are challenged to expose darkness. These verses, I'll read them. I think it is 11 to 14. And it's King James, King James, 11 to 14. 11 to 14 says, And we have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to expose them. So you see somebody doing a wrong, and the only thing you can do is that he's not part of my array. So you, you walk away. That is condoning sin. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light itself. Hallelujah. Therefore, he says, awake, all you who sleep, 
arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. So I pray that we'll be able to expose the darkness as anchors, as ambassadors of this gospel of truth that has been given to us. Um, I can't get off before emphasizing the importance of discernment in today's world. We must be able to discern our audiences, discern our emotions, discern people's emotions, discern the needs of society so that we are able to you know, offer a sweet essence to, to, to Christ. We need to inspire others in everything that we do. We need to inspire others, especially new believers who have just been born again into living a life worthy of calling a follower of Christ. So um, I, I, I sign off by saying, may the Lord help us um, to, to achieve these four things, to imitate him as the scripture has told us in love and perfect, and perfect the acts of love like we saw, um, to help us avoid any manner of immorality because we learn that in the place of immorality, our worship, our praise does not rise like essence to Christ. Worse still, we do not, we are excluded from the kingdom of Christ and God. Uh, I also pray thirdly that we shall be the children of light in seeing and also in our conduct and in our walk that shall be seen as children of the light, those who are loved and known of the works and the near righteousness or, or, or glory that is desired of us by God. Uh, then lastly, that we shall have the, the grace, we shall have the energy, we shall have the zeal to expose all man of darkness in our society uh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I give you praise, I give you glory, I give you honor for this, your word that was given to us. I pray that even as we uh, soldier through this week and the season of Christmas, King of Kings, you will give us a gift of love. Father, I pray that we shall be able to radiate in this love. Your word has told us that you gave yourself up. Yes, you gave yourself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. I pray that as we live this life, King of Kings, you will observe and desire that we appear the same to you, King of Kings, Father. When we pray, may our prayer rise like essence to you, King of Kings, Father. I pray that you separate us from all sorts of iniquities and sin and immorality that make us appear far from you, not just in appearance, but actual, actual being distant, King of Kings, Father. I pray that for every saint, you assign them an angel, King of Kings, who brings us back to course, O Lord and Savior. I ask that your fruit of the Spirit will be our portion. I ask that we shall be your children, King of Kings, who are seen and admired because of the works you've done in our lives. I give you praise. I give you glory. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Grace, for that exposition. Uh, thank you for allowing the Lord to use you this morning and for having taken the time to sit at the feet at the feet of Jesus and listen to what he has to share with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Let us receive the word and we pray for our brother. Lord, our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for grace. Thank you, Lord, for his life. Thank you, Lord, that he immerses his life in your word and is able to bring out the treasures, the treasures that you have hidden in your word and has been able to help us to understand this uh, this passage, this what you have you wanted us, he gave us the message that you put on his heart. Lord, I want to thank you. <clears throat> thank you for his life. Thank you for all the things that concern him, his family, his work, his, his life in other areas. Lord, I thank you for him. Lord, thank you for his spiritual life, Lord, that he knows you and he can confidently share about you, not out of other people's experience, but because he knows you, he loves you, Lord. I pray, Father, for him. I pray a blessing upon him. I pray a blessing upon his family. 
I pray, Father, that out of where the abundance that you have, he has shared with us, that you live in, uh, pour more of you in him, oh God, so that he can continue to be a blessing to his family, that he'll continue to be a blessing to his workplace, that he'll continue to be a blessing to the church, that he will continue to be a blessing to this nation, oh Lord, that he will be, you You lift him up, oh Lord, lift him up, promote him, oh Lord, in his life, oh Lord, in all areas of his life, Lord, I pray for a promotion that, Father, he will see you clearly, he will demonstrate your love, that he will see what you have done, Lord, and he will honor you and give you glory. Thank you for him, Lord. We pray a cover on him, protect him, O oh Lord, <clears throat> against any backlash of the enemy because of having served you, Lord. That, Lord, he will never regret the time that he has used, O oh Lord, to prepare and to serve you, Lord. But he will see more and more blessings come upon him, Father. We thank you and bless you. Father, we want to thank you for this word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father, that you care for us so much, that you come in our lives, that you're present in our lives, and that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Lord, your love is amazing. Just as Grace was describing what you went to, O oh Lord, the extent that you went to, dem to demonstrate your love for us, that you love us. You love us undeservedly. We we de we don't deserve even a, a, any point of the love that you have for us. While we are still sinners, going our own way, unconcerned about you, you chose to come as a baby, Jesus. You chose to come into human form so that you could have a body that would later be beaten and 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 pierced and all those things, O oh Lord, that were done to you when we at the cross or even before the cross. Oh Lord, your love is amazing. Your love, your love, oh God, is high. It is so incomprehensible sometimes. When we it's hard to imagine why you would even dare to come, why you would choose to come to live amongst us, why you choose, O oh Father, to give your one and only son to come and die for us. But you did, O oh God. Thank you for that love. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. Thank you for that love. Lord, you have asked that we should mimic you. And Jesus, you were very clear before you left the earth. You told your disciples that they should love one another and that it is when they love that people will know that they are your disciples. Lord, when we examine our lives, we know that we fall short. We have fallen short. We have not loved as we ought. We have not loved you even as we should. We've not responded to your love by loving you back. We have been not, we have not been as loving to the children, your children amongst us. We have wanted to get something. We, we, we love because there is something we want to get from someone. We love because they've done something for us. We don't have the sort of sacrificial love that you have spoken to us about this morning. We ask for forgiveness, Lord. We, are, we fall short. We admit that we fall short, Father. But Lord, we've also been reminded that you don't ask of us something that you know we can't do, that we can't have. Lord, we want to have that fragrant offering. We want that aroma to come to you. And so, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us because we know that love is a fruit of the Spirit. And we cannot create it in our lives. We cannot make it of our own. But Lord, I pray that you help us to submit to you that you help us to submit to the Holy Spirit so that he can bear that fruit of love in our lives, so that we can be self-emptying, that we will also give of ourselves, that we will give ourselves to you, that we will give to others, O oh Lord, without expecting anything in return, O oh Lord, that people will see us and know that indeed Christ lives in us, O oh Lord. 
Father, I pray that you help us to submit to your spirit. Give us a willing heart, a heart that is willing to learn from you because we can only learn that love at your feet, Jesus. You are the ultimate expression of love and we can only become that when we sit at your feet. So help us, Lord, to grow even more intimate with you, to seek after you, to look, to run after you, Lord, that we will leave all other things that we have we we've loved oh god and we will focus our love on you lord father we've been reminded that we cannot give you an offering when there is sin in our lives oh god when we are not living as children of light so lord i pray that you forgive us because amongst us there are things that immoral things that have made us uh that you don't even want us in, um, in to see us sometimes because of the immorality that is in our midst, the greed, the corruption. Oh, God, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy. The coarse jokes, the words that we speak that we shouldn't, the unloving attitudes that we have amongst us, oh, Lord. You look at the church and it is not ready. Because, Lord, you're very clear that you come for a, a church that is pure, a church that is blameless. But, Lord, amongst us there is quarreling, there is struggle, there is strife, there is greed, there is immorality. Lord, we ask that you forgive us, especially for us at All Saints Cathedral. Lord, the things that are in our midst that make you, that make you sad, that make your heart break lord we ask that you help us to see ourselves as you see us that we will examine our hearts amongst us those who are involved in any immorality that we will turn that will repent and come to you lord i pray that you help us to be children of light that lord people who see us will really see jesus that people will get attracted to you because of who we are I pray that your light will shine through us, O oh Lord. I pray that, Father, you will take us into your intimacy, that we will walk in your love, that we will walk in your light, because, Lord, you are light, and you've said that we are light of the world. Help us, Lord, to live as children of light, that we will not walk, that we will not as walk as children of darkness. And, Father, help us, O oh Lord, to wake up from our sleep, that we will wake up, O oh Lord, in the things that we have slept in, that things that we have gone in that have that are making us sleep, O oh God. Help us, O oh Lord, by your spirit to be able to have the zeal to expose the darkness. Lord, help us not to cover up darkness. Many times, O oh Lord, especially in the church, we have seen darkness, but we wa we want to pretend that it is not there. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you help us. Help us to expose the rot that is in our midst. Because, Lord, as your word says, when the darkness is exposed, it becomes light. So help us, Father, as, as individuals, as a church, to stand against darkness, to expose darkness, so that many will turn to your light. Lord, even as we come to the time of celebrating Christmas, Lord, I pray that many will see and turn to the light, that they will stop walking in darkness and in blindness, O oh Father, that you'll open their eyes, O oh Father, that you'll help us to work with you, Lord, as your co-workers, to bring many into the light, that, Lord, many will come to know you, that there will also be a fragrant offering, that they'll be able to bring to you a fragrant offering that honors you, that makes you glad, that sm smells sweet in your nostrils, that we will not come as a stench, O oh Lord, that there will not be a stench coming from us, O oh Father, that, Lord, when you see us, you'll be pleased, that when we bring our prayers and our petitions, they will become, they will come as sweet-smelling offerings, O oh Lord. We exalt you, we magnify you, we worship you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. You are a good God. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. We honor you. We lift you up. We bless your name. You are God of gods. You are Lord of lords. You are Lord of God. There is none like you. We worship you and bless you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and believe. Amen. Amen.